to our broadcast this evening. In a moment, I'm going to hand over to Hannah, who will be hosting uh, the broadcast for us. Uh, but before I do that, um, as part of the team up here in Manchester that run broadcasts, I just want to say a big thank you to anyone watching this, wherever you are in the world, if you've been praying for our city uh, this week after what has happened. We really appreciate all your prayers. It's been great seeing how God has brought the city together, brought the people together, brought the churches together uh, in Manchester. And we'll be privileged this evening to hear from one of the leaders of one of the churches in, in the city, um, Judith, who Hannah will introduce to you in a moment. So I'm going to hand over to Hannah now and she will make the introductions. Good evening everyone and welcome to broadcast. I'm hoping that the weather has been as wonderful for you as it has been here in South Wales. Um, tonight we've got the honour of uh, hearing from Judith Anis, who is one of the leaders at King's Church Manchester, part of the pioneer group of churches. She'll be sharing about how God calls us into ministry, uh, part of which will be about her own story. So I'm um, really looking forward to tonight. Um, but before I hand over, um, can I just run through um, how this next hour should run, especially for those of you who are watching for the first time if you're watching live. So the first 30 minutes we'll be handing over listening to Judith and then for the final 30 minutes it's um, kind of your chance really to put your questions to Judith. All you need to do is click on the questions box, type away, and when the time comes, then I will be able to ask those questions. So um, without further ado, um, Judith, we're handing over to you. Okay, am I on? Is this it? Hello? Has this worked? Hi, my name is Judith and um, you know, it's such a privilege um, to be with you this evening to share with you um, on calling. So I've been asked to um, talk to you about calling and you know, this is a fantastic subject. It's so amazing in terms of like it affects every single one of us, every single one of us here listening tonight will, um, you know, obviously um, has a sense of calling on their lives, that the fact that they want to listen to this. And, you know, and it is true that actually when God calls us, when God saves us, that, that actually um, there is more, there's more for us. He saves us for a purpose and a calling. And, you know, we can have, quite often we can have mixed emotions about um, calling. I don't know, um, like what you were like but you know when you're hearing people share about the calling of God and their life you think wow that's amazing it's so good you know I wish I had that calling that's so good and and then you can hear someone else share their calling on their life you're thinking oh thank you Jesus I don't have that calling and you know when it can be so different from one person to the next and and so I wanted to talk to you like about like two or three things really tonight um Firstly, just quickly and briefly um, looking at how, you know, how important it is to recognise calling in other people um, and valuing that. Also, talk about, you know, looking at the calling that we have and stepping into the calling on our lives, as well as give you a little bit of my testimony of, of um, how I heard God to, to come into leadership. Um, you know, in John 6, we can read the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, an amazing miracle. And, you know, and later on in that chapter, we see how some of the people that um, were there, that were fed, started following Jesus around. And, you know, we don't know why they were following Jesus around. Maybe they were looking for their next meal and they were thinking, great, we had this amazing meal, let's follow Jesus. But... When they started talking to Jesus, one of the questions that um, they asked Jesus was, um, what, we, was, what must we do to do the work of God? And Jesus answers them in John 6, verse 29. He says to them, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. See, it's not enough to um, believe that Jesus is a good man, um, um, to do the work of God is to actually believe that actually he was sent by God. To do the work of God is to believe that those that God sends 
um, have been have been sent from him. Um, you know, we know that Jesus is very capable of revealing himself to people, and you you know you maybe even have heard stories of Muslims who have, who G, Jesus revealed himself to to them you know, in a vision or in a dream or that kind of thing. And so Jesus can, is quite capable of revealing himself to people. But the thing is, what he actually chooses to do is to reveal himself through you and me. And you can read more about that in John 17 of Jesus' heart of, of expressing himself through you and me and, and the unity between us and him. You know, in John 20, verse 21, it's... Um, it says, um, and again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So we are sent in the same way as the Father sent Jesus. And I just would like to read um, a passage, actually, from Mark chapter 6, verse 1 to 6, um, which starts like this. Mark 6, verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, town, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many, many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What, what's this wisdom that, that's been given him? What are these remarkable miracles that he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except to lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. You know, Jesus was sent to them to do miracles and, and people were recognized the authority and were amazed by his teaching and what he was doing. But when people started to talk about that actually they knew him and um, they knew his mother, they knew his father, they, they saw him being brought up and they knew his siblings, that, that actually they started to take offense at him. They were offended by Jesus because they knew him and they couldn't equate the fact that he was doing all these miracles and these amazing teachings and, and they knew him. They, they may have seen him running around as a child with his brothers and sisters. And what they were doing, they were looking at his humanity and failing to see that actually this was somebody that was sent by God. You know, when people saw his humanity and and they were offended. They, they weren't able to see his calling anymore. They weren't able to see that actually the Father had sent him to display miracles amongst them. So there were many miracles that weren't performed after that. You know, recognizing the calling on someone's life um, um, may mean that you have to look past their humanity um, you know, look past their character traits, maybe even looking at where they've come from. My husband tells his story to my distress because I don't actually think it's that bad. But he tells his story of um, of when we decorate our Christmas tree at Christmas time. And I let the kids put whatever they want on it. Because I kind of feel like, you know, Christmas is all about the kids having fun. And so I let them decorate the tree and all kinds of things go on there. Even things that they create as a child, as babies go on there. And, and actually one by one, you know, some of that stuff is like finding its way to the bin because it's getting all old and tatty and crumbling and stuff like that. But when the Christmas tree is finished, it's got all its lights on there and all colourful decorations on there. Um, uh, my husband says, it looks a mess. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, it doesn't. It looks fine. And then he said, but actually, when you squint, because of the lights and the colours, when you squint, that actually the tree looks really pretty. Now, sometimes when we're looking at... Um, 
people and all we can see is their humanity or their failings and you know we we tend to fail to see Christ in them we tend to fail that actually do you know what God has got their hand on them God is using them and wants to use them but we struggle to see them and you know maybe it's something that um you know that they've said maybe they're frustrators maybe they're you know they're kind of a little bit annoying or their personality crack clashes with us or or they said something offensive, then, you know, when that happens, it makes it really difficult for us to um, receive from them. So when we look at people, we may have to look at them with a squint and allow the Holy Spirit to show us the calling on their lives and, and, and then open ourselves to receive that from them, that, that maybe that God has sent them to us to help us, to build us up, to stretch us so that we can be all that God has called us to be, so that we can step into the calling that God has for us. You know, if we try squinting so that we don't see their failings, but all that we see is a calling of God upon their lives, that when you see that they are sent from heaven, it actually en enables you to receive the things from heaven from them. Now, God has a blessing for us, and, and as we receive those that he has called, we are doing the work of God when we receive them. Now, you also have a calling on your life. You can be anywhere on that journey from just stepping into it um, to it being outworked in you and through you for many years. Maybe you've been stepping out of one calling and into another as one season of your life closes and another one starts. And wherever you are on this journey, the purpose of, of our calling is that we are a blessing and we are sent to the church and into the world to be just that what calling does for us it gives us the faith to do what God is asking us to do now for some reason however impossible it seems um, to those around you or however however seemingly stupid um, it is that you feel that God has called you to do it may even be dangerous in fact and people are warning you and telling you not to do it but you know with all of your heart and with all of your mind that you are in the right place doing the right thing. We know in our heart that if God has called us, then we, then we have all of heaven's resources available to us. You know, there is this thing in us that happens when we are um, in the middle of doing whatever it is that God has called us to do. And it doesn't matter what people say around us, what kind of situation we find ourselves in, what kind of difficulty we are facing. When we are called by God, there is this faith that says we are in the right place doing the right thing. John 15 verse 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give to you. Ephesians 3 verse 20 says, That he is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. And 1 Thessalonians 5 Verse 24, the one who calls you is faithful and will do it. Isn't that amazing? The one who calls you is faithful and will do it. If that doesn't give you a sense of rise of faith, then, you know, that is just like, just amazing that we can actually go to God and know that when he's called us, when he has brought us to a place of saying, this is my plan and purpose that I am calling you into, um, then there is this rise of faith that helps us and keeps us going. You know, I love the story of Moses, and there are many stories in the Bible of people that who were called and used mightily by God. But the story that um, I just want to mention tonight is the story of Moses. You know, I don't think Moses successfully led a nation because he strongly believed in his unique talents. Moses saw something he heard when he heard the call of God on his life. And no matter how painful or how difficult things were, um, he followed it through because of the confidence, the faith, 
and the authority, the anointing that came upon him when he heard that call to go and set the people free. You know, when Moses was at the burning bush um, being told to go and fulfill this amazing plan that God had for him, Moses replied, how can I do it? And he expressed self-doubt. And, and I'm sure that many of us here, you know, when we've heard the call of God in our lives, there has been this thing in our heart, but I don't know, is this really for me? Is this right? I don't know if I can do it. You know, the thing what really kind of like spoke to me about the story of Moses was that God did not turn to Moses and say to him, well, do you know what? You are the right person for this task. You lived with Pharaoh in the palace, so you, you know what it's all like in the palace. You were there as a child and you know exactly how it works. Um, you've been shepherding the sheep for years in the wilderness, and you'll do a great job leading my people. In fact, you've spent so much time in the wilderness that you already know your way around. You know, God did not say that to Moses. He didn't start telling him all about his qualities and his giftings and his abilities and all the things that he's done right up until then to, to get him ready. God's response was completely different. And, it was in, and I want to read what his response was. It's in Exodus 3. So in Exodus 3, verse 12, it says this, And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, well, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am, and this is what you are to say to the Israelites, I, ha I am has sent me to you. You know, Moses' confidence, authority, calling came from the one who sent him. The one who sent him was God, who is holy, awesome, almighty, the one who created heaven and earth and everything in it. He is the I am. And now he was calling Moses to be part of that amazing plan, part of, to be a part of God's amazing plan. You know, in the natural, when you are given a job to do, hopefully you have good employers and they will give you all the resources that you need to carry out that job. We, are, we have the authority, the finance, the equipment, the training, whatever we need from, from our employer to carry out the tasks that we have been appointed to. When we step into the calling of God for our lives, knowing that he is the almighty, holy, awesome God um, that has created us, um, he will enable us and give us the, the, the strength, give us the whatever we need to, to do whatever it is that he's called us to do. And we will have the faith to accomplish um, everything. And he will give us all that we need to accomplish this task. You know, it won't matter if you're facing the great walls of Jericho or that there is a massive big sea blocking our route. If God has called us, he will give us what we need to make a way for us. He did not choose any of us because of our unique giftings or qualities. He chose us because of his love and plan for us. Our gifting, our qualities may help us in our calling, but they won't tear down those walls or part the seeds. It's the great I am that calls us, that goes ahead of us, that walks with us, that walks beside us and walks behind us. And it is in that place of weakness and vulnerability, facing that wall, that we can remind ourselves of the call of God on our lives, reminding ourselves of the calling that, that we that we have will give us the strength, the motivation and faith to keep on going and believe that, that he will make a way for us where there seems to be no way. Um, I'm going to read a bit from 1 Corinthians verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26. It says this. Brothers and sisters, 
Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to, sh to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, holiness and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, that let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And it's an amazing passage, that, and you could, you could do a whole massive sermon on that passage alone. You know, Paul wrote letters about not boasting in his achievements or accomplishments. In fact, he preferred to point out where he was weak so that actually God would be revealed through his weaknesses. He would prefer to point out where he lacked wisdom, so that where he was foolish, so that God's wisdom would be revealed and displayed. Now, he would rather all the more to boast of his weakness so that God would be glorified and be revealed. And this is something that, um, that um, should be really precious to every single one of us that has been called by God, that actually it's nothing that we have done, it's nothing that we have achieved, any abilities or, or anything that, that means that we have been called into the situation that we have been called in. You have not done anything to deserve the calling that you have on your life. You know, so this should give us confidence in our calling because when things start to get difficult, um, we, we can remember that actually we're not chosen because our abilities are good qualities, but that simply he chose us because he loves us and that he is with us and that he has this amazing plan for us and that actually he has chosen us and it is a difficult time, but he's going to give us exactly what we need to get through it. We can rely on a God who is the great I am. If we have been obedient to respond to the call of God in our lives and put our trust in him, then it is up to God for whatever it is to be a success. And we can take the pressure off ourselves. God can make anything succeed and he can make anything out of nothing. And he doesn't actually need us. If God is wanting a certain outcome, he will do that without he can do that quite easily without us. But actually, he has chosen to do it with us. He wants to do it with us. He wants to partner with us. He wants to share in his glory with us. So we can relax when we put our trust in God and not in ourselves or in our abilities. Now, there is a beautiful psalm, lots of beautiful psalms, but um, one particular psalm, 139, written by David where he talks about his intimacy with God, that God chose him, that God knew him from the foundations of the earth. That even before um, he was born, God knew him. Even before he was in his mother's womb, God knew him. And, um, you know, and it, it talks about how, you know, that God is always near. It doesn't matter where David goes, that God is always close to him. You know, he even knows our thoughts. And in verse um, 16 of 139, David says how all his days were ordained, written before one of them came to be. You know that he has ordained you, called you to a specific purpose, which he had in mind before you took even your first breath. And you have all of heaven's resources available to you. To achieve that which God has called you to. You know, that can freak some people out, thinking, oh, God knows everything about me, even before I say a word, God knows where it is. But but we can have confidence in that, that actually, you know, God knows us, he knows what we're thinking, and yet he still you chooses to use us.
this is where we've got to and Judith was just talking about the fact that God still chooses to use us. Judith, you're back. I was just giving a little uh, run up there. You, we got to the bit where God is God, you were saying that God, hello Judith, you were saying that God still chooses to use us and then you froze. So right. um, back over to you. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so we, we may not be perfect, we may have things going on in our lives, but God, is it, is it working? Yeah. Um, you know, we, um, we may not be perfect, we may have things that are going on in our lives, but, but God still chose, choo chose us and, um, and he certainly doesn't wait until we are perfect, um, but it's just, we, you know, when we're obedient to God and we respond to his call, then we don't have to wait till we, till we are perfect. You know, I've been a Christian um, from a very young age. I was about eight years old when I was a Christian. I was brought up um, in a Christian family, which is a real blessing to anyone that's brought up, hopefully, anyone that's brought up in a Christian family, hopefully they find that as a blessing. But I certainly did. And... And in that time, I've, in my, um, from the moment I was saved, right up until like, um, um, probably my, until recently, probably, I never aspired to lead a church. And as I got older and started becoming interested in boys and all of that, you know, I didn't even want to, to be married to a church leader. I, I actually remember specifically thinking, I have, I never want to be married to a church leader. But God had different plans for me. Firstly, I married a man who later became a church leader after 18, 18 months of marriage. Then about 15 years after being married, um, God called me into church leadership. And now I co-lead a church with my husband, the team of leaders that lead the church. Um, and I've been doing that now for, for the past five years. Um, I've had different callings on my life at different seasons of my life, some of which have progressed and developed over time. And maybe it was the same calling, but how I've walked it in it, may, it looks different um, in different seasons of my life. But I remember this one time during a worship time. It was a normal Sunday worship meeting, and, and I was just worshipping God, and I, was, I really sensed the presence of God, and, and God started showing me something that was really, really powerful, and it really affected my emotions. And it wasn't really a picture, something that I could describe. So you couldn't actually draw it or anything like that. But I knew in my spirit exactly what it was that I was seeing, what I was experiencing. I saw the bride of Christ and I experienced Christ's love for her. But as I was looking at her, I could see that she wasn't perfect. I saw disunity. I saw all kinds of imperfections and things that weren't right and but I also sensed Jesus's passion and love for her in that moment I felt the love of God for church for the church like I'd never felt it before I just felt this overwhelming sense of do you know what I really really love the church I remember I started to cry, I started feeling overwhelmed with this love and this feeling towards the church and, and in that moment I, I felt, I knew that God was calling me to help make her bride ready. I didn't quite realise in that moment he was calling me to church leadership but it was in that moment that helped me to step through open doors as they opened. And when the door of church leadership opened, I stepped right in there with both feet, knowing that this was where God wanted me to be. And I felt honoured and privileged that I was stepping into the calling of God on my life to partner with him and others in preparing his bride. There were times when um, in church leadership, especially right at the beginning, I felt really overwhelmed. There's so many times I felt over my head. I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, in fact, sometimes I still feel a little bit like that. 
Sometimes I felt like my head was underwater, but every door that I stepped into, I felt the growing pains, I felt the stretching, but I was determined because of the call of God on my life, because I knew this was where God was taking me. I knew I had to go through those doors. I knew I had to go through those processes of, of stretching and, and all the pain and discomfort. Then about 18 months ago, um, we planted one of our first communities into another part of Manchester. Um, we now have, um, we already had a community that was in another part of Manchester, so at that time we had two communities, and we'd not planted in a long time, so this was like the one of many plants that we'd, we'd seen the call of God on the church to plant into local um, communities. So this was the first one of, of that that we were going to do. And we planted it into um, a community, but, and with the support of the rest of the leadership and the church, I was to lead the team that, that was gonna, um, that was gonna be um, part of this community to make this community happen. And every single day, I can honestly say that, that when I went to bed every night, when I woke up in the night, when the morning came, my first thoughts were, what on earth am I doing? Who do I think I am? And you know, I'd have all these self-doubts of, like, what if I make a mess of it? What if everyone sees that actually, that, um, that actually it shouldn't have been me, it was a mistake or, or, or something else? And I'd have, or constantly have all these thoughts going on and on in my mind. Do you know that we can quite often be our own worst enemy? I do think that the enemy tells us lies to derail us, but I also think we do a perfectly good job of that ourselves as well. But thankfully, God had shown me that something that made me know that actually it wasn't my idea to be a church leader. It was God's idea for me to be a church leader. And it was his calling that um, on my life to be here in this place. And so I would start speaking to the voices and I would start telling them this is what God says, that actually it's not true, that actually it was God that put me here. And, you know, and, um, you know, and whatever I feel about myself, what even, what even people say about myself, about me, that actually I could be confident that actually this is what God has called me to do. Um, you know, and on all those other times when I start feeling a lack of confidence or things are not quite going quite right or quite, I don't quite understand what's happening next, that, that actually I can go to God and I say, God, um, what are we going to do in this situation? Because our calling is a partnership with our Heavenly Father. You know, and if we can't go to God and say, God, how are we going to do this? And not take it upon ourselves of saying, I've got to do this. I've got to conjure up how this ability or strength or gifting or I've got to find something from somewhere within me to make this happen. That actually I can go to God and say, God, what is it that we can do in this situation? And that's why knowing that you are called and what you are doing is so important. You can tell those voices to shut up. You can even laugh at those voices of discouragement because they are lies that are trying to derail you from the purposes of God. In fact, I strongly recommend laughing at any kind of discouragement that could come your way because it does actually shake it off. The thing that hinders us a lot of the time from our calling is us, ourselves, especially when we are insecure, when we compare ourselves to others, maybe even thinking that the grass is greener somewhere else, not being sure of who we are or, or where we came from or believing in the lies about ourselves can knock our confidence and will get in the way of us stepping in to the calling that God has for us. You know, Moses was actually insecure um, about his speech. And he said to, you know, and God said to him, but I'll give you Aaron and he can help you with that. 
God still called Moses despite his seemingly lack of ability to public speak him. God knows when you are not. God knows what you are good at. He knows, um, he knows what your strengths are. He knows what your abilities are when he calls you. We sometimes think he made us a mistake choosing us because of our lack of ability or, or our weakness. And maybe you think that actually there's someone better at it than you, but, but if God is calling you, then it does not make a difference what you are like in the natural. Moses could have even felt, why don't you just give Aaron the job? He's the what better one at speaking, and he's good at talking to people. But God chose Moses, and, and he responded, and he was obedient to that call. You know, um, there have been many times, um, you know, there may have been many times that you've wondered um, why not you. Maybe you've seen someone, um, you know, um, with a calling on their life and you're thinking, why them? Why? Um, you may think that I've got better experience than they have or actually I'm more gifted at that than they are. Um, the calling put on our lives is not meant to be a competition. It's meant to be a gift, a blessing. And you will have a calling on your life, but you don't get to choose. In fact, when you realize your calling, whether it's what you've always wanted or not, you will know peace and fulfillment living in that calling, even when things are really tough. Now, Jesus, our great example of someone who was sent by the Father, he was secure in who he was and the calling that was on his life, his life. Secure enough that he defied all expectations of some saviour that's come to rescue and save the people. When he got down on his knees and washed the feet of his disciples, Jesus knew who he was and where he came from and where he was going. So my question to you tonight is not, are you a good person? Are you good at what you do? Do you have giftings or talents? But my question to you is, do you know where you've come from? Do you know where you are going? Do you know that, that you are sent from heaven? What have you been sent from heaven to do? What helps us to set, step into the calling of God in our lives is our heart connection with the one who is calling us, listening to him, making ourselves vulnerable to him, not being afraid of our weaknesses, but relying on him that he can do more than we can think or imagine. Now let's also recognize in the call of God and other people's lives and value that and and cherish that as well because you know it might even mean that we have to do a little bit of squinting but this is doing the work of God and will enable us to receive heaven's blessing to us from them okay that's it thank you <laughs> Right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Judith. Um, I'm just uh, conscious that we've got a few questions here, so we're going to dive right in, and um, I'll, I'll ask away, and you, you you get to answer as you wish. So we've got a couple that are similar to start with, and um, the first one is, um, how do you help people who aren't sure of their calling? Um, and similar to that, we've had, what advice would you give to someone who is asking, what is my calling? Okay, so um, it's, it's, um, it's kind of like a difficult and an easy question because I do understand that sometimes it is really hard to know what your calling is. And, um, um, but I think it's, it, you discover your, your calling from that place of intimacy with God, you're in, you know, that time of spending with him, whether it's reading your word, whether it's time of worship or praying and listening to what he is saying, that um, and allowing him to speak of your life. Even, you know, I think sometimes um, 
you know, we can get prophetic words over our lives and that can really, really help us. But there has to be something in our hearts that, that actually jumps when we get those prophetic words that says, yes, this is it. And there's this sense of like, actually, I don't know why I know this is my calling, but I know this is my calling and it is, it's a spiritual thing. And, and so we have to go to our spiritual God, our spiritual father and say, say, is this it? Is this what you are calling me to? And there's this um, desire, there's this longing to, to step into it and to walk into it. Um, and, um, you know, and we have to be patient as well because if God has given us a calling and he's put something in our hearts, it's, we have to kind of say to God, God, I believe this is your word and and be patient and wait for those doors to be opened so that you can start stepping in. Sometimes God calls us to start pushing doors and see if they open so that we can go and, you know, and it can be different for different people. Um, fabulous. Um, this is a follow-on question to that then, which is how important is it that other people recognise and affirm what you feel God is calling you to? Um, it's important to them in the sense that actually they will receive so much more um, of God, of, of heaven's realities from you when they receive your gifting when they receive your calling and it is important that they receive receive it but it's not our responsibility to make them receive it or to make them acknowledge it we have to um, be faithful to what God has shown us do what he's he's told us to do be obedient to him and um, and he he makes a way for us you know and um, you know, and we sometimes the kind of things that that people struggle um, to see calling on people's life is when you know it's like that when I was talking about that squinting thing. They might be looking at your character, they might be looking at your behaviour, and sometimes it can be quite difficult to receive the calling on someone's life when when you see those things in people's life, and and so we do need to squint to be able to see that and. But our job on our own self is actually we need to look at our own character. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to help us, to shape us and to change us. And, you know, and hopefully people will start seeing, yes, God is doing something in them. And then they will be able to start receiving from you. Um, thank you very much. You're looking at talking about squinting and uh, looking at people through God's eyes, through the Holy Spirit's eyes. Um, it says... This question is, you, you mentioned that we need to sometimes look past people's humanity and see the calling of God in their lives. Can you give any examples or any wisdom in terms of how to do this, apart from squinting? <laughs> That's my bit. Um, I think that, you know, if there's someone, perhaps there's somebody that you're thinking of, that perhaps someone that maybe you find a little bit irritating or you're not quite sure about them or what's going on, um, um, as well as getting to know them and spending time with them, I think the biggest way to um, to see the call of God in someone's life is actually going to the Holy Spirit and spending time praying for them and thinking about them and asking God to show you what is their gifting, what is it that they're good at, what is it that that um, that God it might be calling them to. And it actually does help you to start seeing them differently. So we we turn what we so so quite humans we we are very affected by first impressions. You know, there's the saying, isn't there, that the first sixty seconds count. You know, and people take that away of that impression and they think that's what you're like. And 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 I think when we're looking for calling on people's life, we have to think. I'm not going to look at the first impressions. I'm not going to look at what um, you know, what the things that they said that, that came out of their mouth first or their actions. But actually, I'm going to look at what it is that God sees and, and asking the Holy Spirit to help with that. Um, fabulous. And um, in terms of your own calling, 
in your life. You, you touched on that towards the end. We've got a couple of questions. How have other people and other leaders helped you find God's calling in your life? So other people, leaders shaping that or calling that out in you? Um, I think... Um... Um, I think as I've stepped into situations that um, have arisen, um, um, like doors have opened to me, and I've I've stepped into that situation or circumstance, or um, and and I've I've been encouraged by the leaders around me. So I'm now leading a church with my husband. My church was the leader of the church, or is the leader. And um, you know, and, and led a team of leaders that led the church, and and I came into that leadership team, and now I co-lead alongside him, and and I think in my leadership journey, I have had people in the that leadership team that have been really encouraging towards me, and and um, and helped me and strengthened me. I think the biggest thing that's really helped me in my calling and and growing and stepping out is um, is my husband Richard. He has been, is, you know, he he's my biggest supporter, my biggest encourager, but he's actually my big, biggest critiquer. <laughs> and he will tell me actually if I'm wrong. He will tell me I've made mistakes. He will tell me if something's really rubbish. He will tell me don't say it like that. It wasn't great or you know, and he's really, really helped me. And even though some of those times it's been really, really painful and it can be really raw, you know, when someone has told you actually that wasn't that great, um, it can be quite um, painful. But actually, um, I think that's the sort of thing that's really helped me to grow and being open to that. And I want to hear the critique. I want to hear that because... I believe that actually if God has placed me somewhere and he's got a role, he's got a calling for me, that I want to be the best that I, I can be. And the only way I can be the best I can be is by learning from those around me, from, from those pe my peers that support me and encourage me and champion, on, champion me on and, and all of those things that I have to listen to them if I'm going to keep walking in my calling and keep growing and developing. Um, so that's a really helpful answer in terms of the, the input that you've had, particularly from your husband, which is uh, very good. Um, when you, you've obviously branched out to lead the, the new community, were you, were you asked by the leaders or was it something that you felt actually we need to bring this to the so we, we feel called to do this? Which way round did it happen? So we were talking about planting into um, an area called Longsite. And, and as a team, we were praying about it and talking about it and um, looking at all the different strategies of what we can do. And, and so we were thinking about who could lead this new community. Um, and, um, and at the time, the church was going through quite a few different, like, um, different things as well. And, and, it, and, and somebody within the group said, well, what about Judith? You, Judith lead it. And... And it was kind of like, it wasn't even on my mind that I should lead it. It didn't even cross my mind. But in the group, it was kind of like a unanimous decision. Yeah, what about you? Do you feel that you could do it? And, and I just instantly thought, do you know what? I think I could. And, um, and, and I was actually in that moment, I just felt really excited. And I thought, yeah, I would really love to do this. So a, a bit of a combination of the two then. Um, <laughs> there's one question here which is a bit different, which is how do you keep the balance between thinking about a calling to something very big, something, you know, um, and then thinking small steps, the next things to be doing along the way? Um, how do I think about calling and then the next steps? Um, yeah, hold the intention, I guess, the big vision, and then the next, the real practical steps of moving towards that. Can you just, you know, make a comment it's, on that? Well, it's um, putting yourself in places where that you as a person, as an individual, will grow, will develop, and be strengthened. Um, 
and um, and just really asking God what should you be doing it could be that God's called you to some amazing thing but actually right now there's a need for someone to do tea and coffee and and this is and you think you know what that hasn't happened yet and I know God has called me to that but in the meantime there's a role here for me or actually and it's just and it's being faithful in the little things and and not ever thinking I'm too big or grand to the calling of God on my life and you know and there and there will be amazing people out there even possibly listen to this that's got some amazing plans that God has got amazing things on their lives that that is just absolutely amazing it goes beyond like what anyone else could be thinking for themselves and and, and so but we have to be thinking well what is God wanting me to do now in the little and we can be faithful with the little and and keep responding to God with the little and and allow God to open the doors to the to the big thing and if it's training if it's Bible school if it's um, some sort of experience in some sort of area it could be that someone's called into to medicine or called to um, to do administration or you know in, in, you know, whatever it is, it's, it's doing what, whatever it is to, to get yourself to that place that you can do it, really. Brilliant. Um, thank you for that. Um, different question. Do you think that God gives calling to churches as well as individuals? If so, can you talk about what this has looked like at King's Church? Um, yes, I do actually believe that um, God calls churches to different things. Um, in Manchester, we, there are lots of churches in the city of Manchester, um, all doing different things. Um, we, you know, we do try to do some unity stuff to, you know, some things, doing things, some things together. But each church has, has got their own like ways of doing things and reaching people. And God really spoke to um, to us as leaders at King's Church about um, um, a specific thing that He wanted us to do. And and at that time, we were at capacity in our building, and we were looking for um, ways of like um, uh, maybe buying a bigger building so that we can get more people in and that kind of thing. We did back to back meetings um, for for months and months, and we knew that this wasn't what God wanted it for us so we were looking for a bigger building and then God really spoke to us about actually it's not a bigger building that I'm calling you to but what um, um, I'm calling you to is to have small communities all around the city of Manchester and, um, and we had like pictures of different lights coming on all over the city of Manchester and and, and different things and, and we just knew this was the word of God for us as um, a church and so um, that's when we planted Long Sight. Um, we've also recently planted um, into um, North Manchester and to South Manchester. We had two communities already meeting in the city centre um, and then there's one in Salford as well. So we now have six communities um, and um, and we're just really seeing the favour of God on that, and the people that have gone to be part of those communities, um, you know, are just really finding that actually a new lease of life. Um, people who got lost in a big church meeting are now getting really involved and stuck in. But, but one thing that really that God was really showing us and helping us to see was that that when we reach out to people and we we talk to them and evangelize to them and we invite them to church that actually for them to come all the way from some place that they live all the way into the city center was really not attractive to them and it didn't really it wasn't appealing to them and and so bringing people to your local community in the city center just didn't seem so this just seemed like a really great opportunity to move into local areas where we can reach the local communities do things in the local communities to really reach out and hopefully start seeing more people reached and saved. So that's what it looks like for King's Church. Fab. Okay, so we, we're going to head to our final question, which is a two-sided coin, I believe, is the expression. Um, the first part is, how do you handle people? So we're looking in terms of calling in others who feel called to an area of ministry 
that you don't see in them. And the other side is that, um, how do you support people who are clearly called to something, but they don't see it themselves? Yes, that is two or sides of the coin. <laughs> um, okay, so how to help people who think they're called, but actually you just do not see it. Um, it'd be just interesting to talk to them about why they think they're called, um, what's what's made them feel that they're called to that. Um, you know, people who are called to things, they will be able to, to tell you that an instance or a situation or even um, um, whether it's a moment in time or even if it's a period of time of where something has grown within them, they'll be able to express what it was that helped them see this is what God has called me to. And so it'd be interesting to talk about that and to um, um, maybe pray about that with them. You know, um, maybe think about what is it, what's the reason why you can't see that calling on their life? Is it, is it a matter of actually they're not behaving um, in a way that's fitting for that calling? And is there something that actually they could have help with, their character, or, you know, maybe they need discipling in some way? And so it's just working with them and, and praying with them and, and just helping them along that journey and, and being really honest with them and saying, um, I don't actually see that calling. And, it, and I think honesty is really, really key in, in anyone's um, spiritual growth and development, being really honest. And so saying to someone, I don't actually see that calling on your life. And, you know, I do struggle to see that calling. But I am willing to work with you and help you and work it out with you, spend time with you, maybe... Um, you know, just let's look at ways that we can help develop you and, and just see how that goes. Um, what was the other coin, side of the coin? I can't remember now. <laughs> um, the second part was um, how do you support others who you think have got a clear calling but they don't see it themselves? Okay. Um, so again, it's, I mean, there, there has to be a response responding to a call isn't there and a, a sense of that obedience and but if they don't see it um, then it is really really difficult and so it's just praying for them helping them maybe talk to them about oh I see this on your life or or whatever but, but you have to let them in the end of the day they have to see it because because having a calling on your life is is that that helps us, that sustains us through the difficult times. So telling someone that you've got, they've got a calling on their life um, isn't enough unless they see it for themselves. Because if they find themselves in a really difficult situation, they've got nothing to hold on to except for the fact that their friend or their minister or whoever told them that they're gifted at this, but they don't feel it and, and that's not going to sustain them or help them. So they need to have that revelation for themselves. And so, so you know, giving them a word and, and letting them weigh it, maybe encouraging them to weigh it and pray about it and, um, and just leaving it with them. And never is that more true than a church planter's. Um, definitely knowing that God has called you um, is definitely helpful where, like you say, it's tough and you've got that inner conviction. Um, mm -hmm. Um, and yeah so um, yeah. anyway I think that just about draws our time to conclusion uh, just a thank you Judith for sharing this evening I hope those of you that watch live have found that helpful and uh, Judith answered your questions um, as you um, in a helpful way and uh, hopefully this has been um, helpful for those of you that are watching it in the weeks to come can I just encourage you that in listening to this talk, if you feel that there are other people um, that you know, friends, people in your church, that you think this will be a really helpful talk for them to listen to, please copy the link and uh, send that on because this is a, a quite a broad topic in terms of the way Judith has spoken about it and could benef benefit many people. So, um, so that's a great encouragement. Can I also point you to the other resources on our website? There's been a really excellent podcast put up there very recently by um, the lovely Mike Pilavacci, um, all about obedience, which goes really hand in hand with the topic that we've talked about tonight. Um, 
Other than that, it's probably best to mention the next broadcast is in two weeks' time, and we have the lovely Neville Jones, who is from the Church of Christ the King in Brighton, and uh, so that's going to be really exciting to his, I, I'm aware that he's quite involved in uh, the churches in Berlin, so he's going to give us a bit of an international flavour, I hope, too. Um, but until then, it's just a really warm good night from the broadcast team, and um, thank you for joining us, and uh, uh, we see you next time.